I did not take up arms against the apartheid government out of some hateful emotion of resentment and anger. I took up arms because of the need to overthrow a tyrannical regime. I was in prison with four life sentences. I might never have been released. Dennis Goldberg spent one third of his life behind bars. Dennis Goldberg and Ahmed Kathrada were sentenced with Nelson Mandela for sabotage and conspiracy to overthrow the party state. Kathrada of Indian extraction and Mandela and other Africans were imprisoned on Robben Island. Dennis Goldberg, the only white, was imprisoned in Pretoria, 1600 kilometers away. There was racial segregation everywhere, in prison too. I'm sorry I wasn't on the island because they separated us because of apartheid. I couldn't be with my main group of comrades. We applied to come here from Pretoria and of course they refused. So this was published uh, all over the world to show that Mandela. Now, as for people here, unfortunately, the only person I rec recognize is myself, and that's me. <laughs> uh, but the first thing was confidence. You had to retain that confidence. You are going to win one day. But and we had that confidence all the time. <clears throat> you walk more easily when you were a prisoner than you do now. <laughs> And we are at the medieval cell. Yeah. Nelson Mandela lived for 18 years in this tiny cell. Ahmed Kathrada had a cell nearby. The prisoners worked every day in a limestone quarry. You know, people think that Robin Island was the worst. It wasn't. The white comrades were just a handful. We were, what, 30 of us here, and then we had hundreds and hundreds in the cells there. So there again, you know, one of the things you want in prison is companionship. The more the better. Dennis and them didn't have that. So their position, even from their point of view, was much worse than ours. Do you see that man, face that man? That is Mr. Ahmed Kaltrada. He was in the same case with Mr. Nelson Mandela. They were charged for the same activities. Interestingly, someone was asking me, where is Mr. Goldberg? I haven't heard about him for some time now. Here I am. Good yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. So, Young people are growing up. They don't want to know about the past. Uh, they don't want to know the names. They read Nelson Mandela's autobiography. They read the name Goldberg. They think that's a funny name for a black person. They didn't come black. When they meet me, they say, were there whites in the struggle? Election campaign 2009 in a Cape Town suburb. This is a very poor section of town. Goldberg lives better. 
but not far away. I do share the dream of our new society. One of the things I like about the end of apartheid, we're actually freer than we were. And many people in South Africa are much freer. It's going to take, I think, a generation or two or more to overcome this legacy of terrible poverty. Can you really say you have your full human rights when you can't feed your family? <laughs> there I am, three years old, still wearing shoes with buttons on them, because that's what little boys used to wear. My parents were actually free thinkers. I can't tell you when I first saw people being discriminated against because it was a daily experience. It's a question of when you become aware of the discrimination. I can remember as a five-year-old seeing a man, a coloured man, and saying to my parents, oh, poor man, and my mother saying, well, why do you say he's poor? And I said, well, look at him, look at his clothes, and he's ill, and yes, but why is he poor, says my mother. And I say, because he's black. And she says, what else? Until she extracts from me the little five-year-old son. He's not only black, but he's a worker, and an unemployed worker, and workers are poor. Black and poor, especially poor. I was a five-year-old, and I understood this. The project in Alexandra Township, in one of the poorest areas of the country, it was started by two friends of mine, Tony and Hilary Hamburger. So let's go in. Hilary is a remarkable person. She is a psychotherapist, and they've created a project for traumatized children and their parents. I have committed myself to helping fund their project. This is an old factory building, but people have a place to stay. And so you've, you, you've been here for four or five months, and, and is this your, just the one child? Here Dennis Goldberg is writing his autobiography. He draws a balance sheet of his life. He was married twice. With Esme, his first wife, he had two children. Both wives have died. He lives alone. The son of Jewish immigrants, he was born about the time Hitler established the Nazi regime in Germany. Today, his neighbors are people of all colors. When a white person made love to a black person or a black person to a white person, that was illegal. You went to prison for it. The essential point about apartheid that made it different from acts of racism in other countries and injustices was that the whole system was based on laws that made racism legal. When Goldberg was not even 20, White Africana nationalists gained power in 1948. Racial segregation was intensified by harsh laws and apartheid was at the center of the constitution. This rich country was a white country. Dennis and his wife Esme had two children, daughter Hilly and son David. They lived according to their own beliefs and principles anti-racist and against the apartheid laws. We had a wonderful relationship of family, children, political activity. She was already active when I met her, drew me into activity, which I wanted to be involved in. Dennis and his wife Esme found their place in the modern youth society an organization for racial equality and a socialist society.
Paolo Jordan was the Minister of Arts and Culture. Well, Dennis was uh, an engineer. He was a nice guy, I think. Thanks. And uh, he was the sort of person who could get people to do a job of work when he needed it done. So what I remember is parties. What a handsome young man you were. You weren't that old then yourself. Oh, that's what I mean. Yes, but it was nice having fun as well. Of course, we had fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun as well. As I remember it, how the organization went about was to first get people physically fit, train them in combat without exposing it. Yeah. We were going to have a mountaineering club and all those sorts of things. Right? And then uh, I think the, the, the last meeting I attended, uh, it must have been teaching us how to sabotage a car engine, that the easiest and safest way is to take a potato or a sweet potato and <laughs> stuff it in the exhaust, uh, which means you can't start the car, and that's the last place a driver will usually look. <laughs> and by the time he figures that out, whatever you are doing, right? Yeah. Ah, you're long gone. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, even that was fun, although it was deadly serious. The resistance by black people increased. In 1960, 20,000 people demonstrated peacefully against the past laws at Sharpeville. 69 were shot dead, and at Langa in Cape Town, three were killed. Unrest and strikes followed. A state of emergency was declared. The 50-year-old nonviolent ANC was declared illegal. Dennis Goldberg looked for other ways to resist the arbitrary rule of the racists. The leadership of the ANC went underground. Later, they set up a military wing, Umkondwe Siswe, MK, the Spear of the Nation. Goldberg was naturally with them in MK. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. I was approached in Cape Town. Dennis, we have a regional command of Mkonto Wesiswe, the spear of the nation. You are a trained engineer, we need your skills. I remember I was asked to think about it, and I said, yes, of course I'm in. I was only too happy to join. I believed in revolution. I believed in revolutionary overthrow of this apartheid regime. Only one hour's drive from Cape Town, hidden in bushy and hilly country, the first military training camp was held. Goldberg, the white, was the commander of about 30 young men who were learning about sabotage. The veterans enjoy recalling those times. Comrade Willie and Comrade Sandy were two of the future partisans. The song, We Work Together, We Are Soldiers, Soldiers for Freedom. Left, 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 right, left, right. <laughs> but he, he made it into such an African thing. And he had us marching like a military unit. Yeah. And then off we went home in the truck. And the comrades, this was supposed to be a secret camp, you see. The comrades were singing this Amma Johnny song Just and then. beating out the rhythm. <laughs> um, we reckoned we would train ourselves and when we had weapons we would have to perhaps find a, a, a cop who would change sides or something like that. But you know, if you've got to, we made our own weapons. We made our own ways of destroying telephone lines. We just threw a rope over them. You remember? Yeah, I do. It wiped out the communications. Goldberg and MK wanted to blow up high-tension lines and attack apartheid institutions 
to overcome the heavily armed apartheid state. He had not been a soldier. He was nearly 30 years old and he was teaching about sabotage. In a short time, the police rooted out the terrorist camp. He says to us, we need to pull some branches in behind, you know, so that they can't see our, that we, people were walking there. When we were walking to the water point up there. <laughs> I <laughs> forgot all this. No, don't worry. So, but in fact, he was, I mean, those days, he was quite a very, actually, uh, energetic uh, young when man. When we saw comrades like Dennis, then we were so encouraged that now if, if, we, if they are not scared, why should we be scared? We communicated as equals and so on, you know. That was the most important, and he had no problem in just uh, even calling him Comrade Commandant. <laughs> yeah, oh, Comrade Commandant. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted Look Smart to be the commander because it was, it was a, important a, a that... good marching. Yeah, <laughs> but it was important that, you know, the commander has to be in amongst the people and be part of it, and I'm, uh, I'm white. I can't disappear in the community. Mm. Where uh, did you get your military training? In Algiers. Really? Yes. That's even where, where, where I met uh, uh, Chagovaro. You met Chagovaro? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that story yeah, yet. No, that's where we met Chagovaro. And what Chagovaro was he like? gave us a courage, a revolutionary courage, that we must not think we are the only ones. Revolution is man for man. Let's we go and we must go and liberate our people. <laughs> The ANC organized military training in neighboring countries. The East European countries helped the liberation movement, but for Dennis and his comrades, West Germany was one of their most active opponents. We were trained uh, by the former German Democratic Republic. I went for the uh, military-related courses. Well, the a German Democratic Republic supported the struggle against the apartheid and the Federal Republic of Germany either directly supported the apartheid regime or did it indirectly. Franz Josef Strauss, who was a very keen supporter of the apartheid regime. Yeah. I never forget that's where Hitler began. It was a, a variant too. The apartheid made white South Africa and businesses extremely rich very quickly because what it did was to intensify the control over black workers and the issue of apartheid is played out as race and color but there's a very simple proposition they teach in every business school cheap labor makes fat profits and that's what apartheid is about they're quite prepared to do business and let somebody else do the political dirty work. West German politicians and banks kept the apartheid regime alive and gave them weapons and financial support. The apartheid regime, the apartheid regime called us terrorists, of course, and all over the world the fight was against terrorism at that time. The white Afrikaner nationalist regime got support from the Western government because they said they too were fighting against terrorism. But really, they feared that their investments in South Africa, in gold mines, diamond mines, industry, and in trade and commerce would be lost in a black revolution. The security police were after me, so I went underground. I went to our underground headquarters at Lily's Leaf Farm near Johannesburg. Here I was asked to help with building up our underground army. As a civil engineer, a scientist, I was asked to make the weapons we would need. Here I am with my full beard and my hat. To hide my forehead, my high intellectual forehead. Sterner, my intellectual sterner to 
verstecken. Und hier haben wir auch Here we are, the quarters of our first commander, Nelson Mandela. Ihre Treffen gehabt. Ja, natürlich ist die... The room is empty during the restoration process. Es ist saniert, kommt die alte Möbel wieder rein, hat Winnie Mandela... Winnie Mandela used to spend weekends with him, sleeping over in this room. It's not a very nice place, but for camouflage, it all had to be authentic. They planted vegetables and harvested them. It was a real farm. And here we had geese and other poultry and dogs. We are coming to the coal bunker where Nelson Mandela's documents, including his diaries, were concealed and found by the security police. Dennis had left his family and lived underground. Dennis worked under Nelson Mandela and was thought of as a weapons expert for the military wing of the ANC. I was the weapons maker in our underground army. I had not got to the stage where I entered into mass production. I was supposed to. Um, I think we got caught too early for me to actually begin. Perhaps it was lucky because had we started making the quarter of a million hand grenades I was supposed to make and the 48,000 landmines and the Sprengstoffe that were needed, I don't think we would have got life sentences. We would have got death sentences. Um, yes, we did have actions. Yes, uh, people were killed. I don't think we were very willing soldiers. We really were not. How did you feel? When were you planning with blacks? I guess you white guys made her are also white. I didn't look at as white against white or black on black. What I looked at was, how do we bring about justice in South Africa? If you had the chance to do it all over again, would you? If I had the chance to do it all over again, would I? Absolutely. I have no regrets at all, except that I made a mistake. I got caught. <laughs> The South African police swooped upon a mansion in the suburbs of Johannesburg and arrested nearly 20 men and one woman, amongst them what they considered were the leaders of the uh, saboteurs. The tag from the down On the day of the raid, the police came through the patio doors. It was really a shock. It was really a shock. Even though we knew it could happen at any time, but at that moment, my legs felt paralyzed. I had notes in my pocket and I wanted to flush them down the toilet. I came running through here to get to the toilet with my notebook in my hand. But policemen were there before me and I could not get rid of my notebook. There I was, caught, red-handed with the evidence that I wanted to make cast-iron hand grenades. Caught. We, the main accused, were not beaten during the interrogations. Many of our comrades, the witnesses against us, were physically beaten and tortured in various ways. But the pressure, the hatred, the sense that they wanted to murder us was very strong. When you sit in front of a police captain who, when he puts his questions, plays with his revolver, with his finger on the trigger and presses and presses and presses, and presses you sweat. The accused are Nelson Rollinschlala Mandela, 
Walter Max Ulliot Sisulu, Dennis Theodore Goldberg, Govan Archibald Mbeke, Ahmed Mohammed Kathrada. They are charged on two counts of sabotage, one of contravening the Suppression of Communism Act and one of contravening the General Law Amendment Act. Struggles for freedom uh, cost a lot of happiness, you know, a lot of stress and a lot of pain. My wife and daughter were sitting up with friends the night before, waiting for the judge to decide whether he was going to hang us or give us some other sentence. I wish children didn't have to go through things like that. Uh, a lot of children and a lot of wives carried the burden and the pain of a struggle for freedom. We had so many months to prepare for the death sentence. So many months to acclimatize to the fact that there is no alternative. You, you are going to die. The night before was a sleepless night. And the judge, in passing the sentence, was so soft, I couldn't hear what he had said. The crime of which the accused have been convicted, the crime of conspiracy, is in essence one of high treason. People who organize a revolution usually plan to take over the government, but consistent with my duty, the sentence in the case of all the accused will be one of life imprisonment. Then I shouted to the uh, uh, mother. spectators, life. That's what I found out. So Cathy was lucky, he only had one life sentence. <laughs> the rest of us had four life, life sentences. sentences. <laughs> but I got a discount, I served only one. I mean, what a relief to be sentenced to life imprisonment. It was, you know, we smiled and then we laughed. We laughed, laughed. <laughs> Nearly 50 years later, a lecture tour brings Goldberg to Germany. For almost 25 years, he has not been in a prison. In the Gefühl, das ist eingesperrt, the feeling that I would be locked up again returns over and over again. After 24 years of freedom, I still have nightmares when I write or speak about those times. But one has to do it. 22 years in prison has influenced my whole life and my thoughts. I was in prison in South Africa for 22 years, a life sentence, four times over, but I served only one, of course. It's an awful feeling. Esme with our two children. I was already in prison by then. And uh, this was shortly before they were going to go into exile in, in England. The authorities only allowed one letter in six months for the first two years. In the 22 years, I had two visas allowing me back and that's in 67 and in 71 and I didn't see him thereafter. I applied every month for a visa and I never got one. But Dennis's wife was not allowed to visit him so I said of course I will go and visit him and that started 
uh, um, visits that lasted for the next 14 years. And I knew her for a total of about two days in the count up the hours. Prison is a very lonely place. And here was this very beautiful young woman, very intelligent, visiting me often, and enabling me to speak about family, about children, about loving, if you like. Um, and gradually, let me, let me tell you truthfully, I would make a joke. I always make jokes. And she would laugh. And I would realize I'm not crazy. Dennis and Joyce speaking in public to warn against racism. Ordinary prisoners have questions about how you survive 22 years in prison. The political idealist wanted to give them courage. <laughs> and here sits the Ishvida. Here I am, free, but sitting in prison. I must say, it's not easy to come into a prison. The cluck cluck of these huge keys remains forever in your head. Is there another question? Yeah, I have to ask you. 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 Yeah, uh, as German call it, Farita, to the white race. But the main question is, at the end of the day, the, the aim and the objective of fighting the government, to me, is not achieved. Because the apartheid is there. The racism is blight, the apartheid blight. Is it true that racism remains and apartheid remains? Is that what you said? I have to say that older whites cannot understand that they have to share their privileges. They still firmly believe that to be white is to be superior. Vice to sein bedeutet besser zu sein. In Germany, too, there is such hateful prejudice and bigoted thoughts about black Africa and black people. It is for me very important that I should inform young people and adults about my experience in the struggle against racism and discrimination. It is about civil courage. You need that in every country. At home in South Africa, Dennis lives between the present and remembrance. Dennis is happy to meet old comrades. Jeremy Cronin belongs to a second generation of white freedom fighters. He is a deputy minister. But that's not the most important part of this. None of us were ashamed to be in prison. That, that oh, was very absolutely. important, you know. I mean, we were ashamed that we got caught, because <laughs> that hadn't been the intention. But, yeah. um, you know, we're proud to. I remember uh, very clearly when we met, mm. it was uh, September 1976. So I had been sentenced shortly before then mm -hmm. uh, to seven years imprisonment and uh, came to Pretoria Maximum Security in September 1976. And you asked me how long had I got? <laughs> and I said seven years. And you said, that's a parking ticket. You did. You said it was a parking ticket. You, you won't be here long enough to wash the dishes uh, oh, properly. Uh, no, no. What it, arrogance. That eh? wasn't arrogant. It was, it was, uh, it was 
it was a, a well taken point, which is that uh, some of you have been in there already longer than seven years. Mm. Yeah. There was a hanging every week. And then we would hear literally the people shuffling down in leg arms <coughs> down past our section. And then this hollow sound, a bit like uh, cinema seats flapping back, that doof, doof, yes. doof sound. And, of the uh, trap doors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we'd know another th two, three people had been hanged. So at that, at that stage, South Africa was, was one of the major. Uh, 150 hanging. hangings a year on average. Yes, it, I think at this stage it had gone up to close to 300, mm -hmm. 300 in a year. Yeah. So anyway, this this is one poem about that that situation. It says, "Overhead is mesh, to one side is the morgue, to one side the gallows wing. This is our yard." <laughs> Prison is the loneliest time of my life. It's like an emotional desert, really. I was in prison with four life sentences. I might never have been released. You were so, so sad. Oh. And there I thought I was so strong. And I remember once Dennis saying to me after many years, he said, you know, I've said um, goodbye to, I think it was my 47th friend who's left prison. But saying goodbye to people was not easy. Not easy. In the 1980s, the apartheid regime came under increasing pressure. Resistance inside the country was growing. The police could hardly hold the line. Economic sanctions, police actions, and conflicts in neighboring countries brought apartheid South Africa to the edge of bankruptcy. I am prepared to release Mr. Mandela if he would say that he rejects violence as a means to reach and to achieve political ends. My father says, I cannot and will not give any undertaking at a time when I and you, the people, are not free. Your freedom and mine cannot be separated. I will return. Amanda! Agreeing not to be involved in armed struggle, for me, was not a repudiation of having been in the armed struggle. I did not have to apologize. I did not have to say it was wrong. I was 52 years old, and I think soldiering is for young people, not old people. Mandela and other prominent prisoners refused the offer. Only one accepted, Dennis Goldberg. I was released from prison on the 28th of February, 1985. The date is fixed in my memory. I was taken in the prison commander's car to the airport in Johannesburg. We were followed and led by a security police car. That's me the day I came out of prison. Wasn't I young and handsome? And that's with Hilary Hamburger. I must say it was lovely to sit in the back of a car and hold hands and to smell perfume uh, the first time in 22 years. That was amazing. And then I was put on board the plane, the very last passenger. Dennis flew to Israel to a country that was seen to have good relations with apartheid. The reaction of some of his comrades would spoil his joy at being free. They've got a headache. And as she rushed past, this Israeli stewardess gave me some crumpled up tablets in some pink paper, Aspro, and I needed water, and I said, please, can I have some water? 
and the Israelis speak English with a very harsh language. She said, come, and took me off to get water. And then she says, why have you got a headache? Are you sick? And she was so insistent, I explained that I wasn't used to crowds of people, 300 people in a plane all talking. I'd also had a cognac the first time in many years. I had such a headache. And as she's giving me the water, she said, why aren't you used to crowds? And I said, well, I've just come out of prison. How long for? And I said, 22 years. Her face froze. And I could see her thinking, 22 years in prison, rape, murder, rape and murder, something like that, you know? After a time, she sort of dropped one shoulder, looked over it and said, why were you in prison? And I said, for conspiracy to overthrow the apartheid government. And she really threw down the lemon, threw down the knife, turned around and said, welcome aboard our aircraft. Dennis Goldberg, Dennis Goldberg's release led to heated debate in the liberation movement. In Dennis's case, what complicated it, I think, when you were released, they released you to Israel. I went to visit my daughter in Israel. Oh, you went to visit her? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Directly from prison. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe it was also like the Buddha regime nursing the relationship with Israel. Yes. Right? That, oh, yeah, well, nice Yiddish boy. We send him to you. And you see, this is how we, we're not as bad as you think. <laughs> we might have supported Hitler, but, you know, uh, <laughs> and there was discussion about, you know, about that, the circumstances of Dennis' release. When uh, you were released, it was uh, following your agree agreement to sign a yes. certain document, which you first refused to sign. Yes. And which Nelson Mandela was offered to sign and refused, refused. as well. Correct. What made you change your mind? I just didn't feel able to go on any longer. I was tired. I wanted to be out of prison. I felt I needed to leave. I hope my comrades will understand. It's not because I've deserted them or changed my mind. The white comrades were treated as traitors. We were not. So generally they were treated much worse than we were. And when Dennis uh, spoke, uh, I mean rather accepted this, we could understand. So among us here, there was absolutely no uh, doubt about it, there was no criticism or anything, we understood. No, I always uh, have been saying that... Sometimes... Well, was accepting the release a sin, or should one stay in prison till one dies? Yeah. That's the only pure way. And if a sin has been committed, do we fight sin or do we fight the sinner? In the end, people said no. All things considered, Comrade Dennis Goldberg is a part of the movement and we take him back. There was no way that I could possibly stay in Israel and appear to give support to the Zionist state of Israel in this alliance with apartheid. Goldberg went to his family. His grandchildren were almost as old as his children when he went underground and then to prison. My son asked me why I had done what I did to be away from them for so long. In other words, why did I desert them? I wasn't there for him and his sister. And I said to him that I did not know how to elevate my children above millions of children in South Africa who suffered under apartheid. And there was my 28-year-old son crying like a six-year-old. 
because he needed to hear from me that I loved him. Dennis and the children. He wishes they had enough food to eat and all could go to school. He hopes they could find decent jobs. Goldberg believes he can detect the wounds left by the brutal racist regime. He raises funds for a project called Ububele that trains counselors for traumatized children and their parents in the slums of Johannesburg. Does anyone else want to say anything about children hitting? Yes. yes. When, when she grabs me, I tell my mommy and I feel sad. I've spent my life trying to bring about change in South Africa from apartheid. My work was in West Germany, building solidarity amongst people who would oppose their government support for apartheid. That was my job. In the One World House in Munich, Dennis meets supporters from the old anti-apartheid movement. In the 1980s, based in London, Dennis traveled the world to encourage boycott actions against South African produce to weaken the regime. That was the spirit that brought apartheid down. <laughs> Every time you buy a Cape apple, you are buying a bullet to kill our people. The anti-apartheid anti movement, not only in Germany, but worldwide, is probably the most successful international solidarity movement of all time. West Germany and its companies were solidly supporting apartheid financially, with information, diplomatically. MIN made diesel engines in South Africa for South African tanks and armored vehicles to kill our people. Uh, Mercedes made the Unimog, which was used by the military, to transport soldiers and kill people. There was the collaboration with Siemens and one of their subsidiary companies in building nuclear weapons. Apartheid South Africa had nuclear weapons. While most states, including the USA and Great Britain, put some pressure on the apartheid regime, West German politicians had strong relations with the white racists. It took four years until Ahmed Kathrada and then Nelson Mandela were released. And on the day of Nelson Mandela's release, I was sitting in the ITN studio in London commenting on the television feed. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. The day we were sentenced in 1964, the head of prison security said we would never walk out of prison on our own two feet. They would carry us out in a coffin, feet first, dead. And there was Nelson Mandela consciously getting out of the car to walk out of the prison. And this for me was such a moment of triumph. Several years later, after the death of his wife, Goldberg returned home to South Africa to join his fellow freedom fighters in the ANC. But amidst the dream, there was also unhappiness among some members. But Dennis defends the ANC because even though joblessness and hunger drive many South Africans to despair and violence has become widespread in the townships, much has been done. Millions of homes have been built. Hospitals have been opened to all. And 15 years, is but the blink of an eye in the life of a nation. We thought it was for the better that if the black government take over, so everybody will have freedom of movement. But it's not freedom of movement anymore because you have to put high fences, you have to put gates, you've got to put electric wires. 
You gotta have a beam system, alarm system in your house that you know if somebody comes at night, you're not safe in your own house today. <coughs> the apartheid was bad, but now it's very bad. The new president, Zuma, he says we'll just have to carry on till God come back. That's what he said. That's his statement. You know, and the statement is so foolish that what it does to it doesn't give you any hope at all to say, let's work together, let's build up this country. No. I've told my kids already that uh, we will move to Australia. Oh, there was no doubt that there were many who actively supported apartheid. They would not oppose apartheid at that time. But after a very few years, they made Nelson Mandela into Saint Nelson, Saint Madiba. And I find it very hurtful as a South African. I think that the non-racial South Africa that was built, it had also something to do with outstanding figures, white comrades who'd been sentenced together with others in Ravonia. That for me was the great contribution that Dennis in particular made. It became a symbol of, of, of a non-racialism. It's not easy to be a symbol sometimes when you're sitting <laughs> with several life sentences. The Order of Lutuli in Silver awarded to Dennis Theodore Goldberg for his commitment to the struggle against apartheid and service to the people of South Africa. When I was given this Lutuli Award, there were many comrades who said, and about time it should have been given to you long ago. There's a sense that white activists are ignored. And why is that if we're non-racist in our approach? But there's been this tremendous oppression of black South Africans. And I think that comrades who say that people like Jeremy and Dennis and others were the premium paid by white South Africans to have the right to live here have got it just about right. We paid the price, willingly. Oh, my God. Absolutely willing. Thank you. you see, you get old enough, all the little girls come to you. <laughs> bye, good, bye, dear. <laughs> and the young men as well. Come to me. Come to me. Come. <laughs> I have survived um, with honor, and I have been honored. And that's tremendous. I don't think you can ask for more than that. Africa, malu pagani su pondo loyo iswa imitanda so yetu kosi si.